So I am Natalie Metza Garcia and I am the Sea Evangelist of Blue Frontiers. So as a Sea Evangelist, what I do is to even evangelize or spread the message of sea steading across the world. And I am really happy to introduce my two favorite Joes, Joe McKinney and Joe Quirk, who are gonna have a fireside chat about sea steading and they are gonna launch a really interesting project that Blue Frontiers has with Startup Society. So please give these two amazing jokes a big clap. Way too much pressure. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, so uh, Joe has done absolutely amazing things for the movement. He's one of the biggest um, markers of the ideas. You should also read his book, Seasteading. Um, it, it, it's, it's phenomenal. It lays out the economics, the ecological, the practical, and, and the novel aspects of seasteading. And uh, he's done amazing things of scaling it from uh, the movement from a nonprofit, you know, talking about the ideas to starting at Blue Frontiers and getting a memorandum of understanding from the French Polynesian government to create the world's first special e economic Z zone, which was helped cr being crafted by Tom W. Bell right here. Um, so he's an incredibly exciting person, but I want him to tell his story. So, Joe, first and foremost, um, what is your conception of seasteading for those who are a little less familiar? My uh, conception of seasteading is to provide the technology to proliferate the special economic zones that are spreading around the world uh, that are all crammed up against the coasts all over the world. Uh, it seems like they're ready to just spring out onto the sea. And seasteading is a way of saying, uh, we don't even need your land. We'll bring our own land. We want even more economic freedom, even more personal freedom. Uh, we're we're going to instantiate uh, Tom W. Bell's sea zone. And uh, the, if, if you go to coastal countries that already have special economic zones on the books, and you say, we're going to absorb all the cost of failure. We need no public money. But if prosperity happens, that's shared locally. Uh, and if your uh, population is concerned about sea level change, we provide an organic bottom-up solution to that. Uh, so your communities can uh, adjust as they see fit with an affordable floating island technology. And, and, and French Polynesia is concerned they could lose uh, a third of their islands by the end of this century. Uh, whether that's true or not, that is certainly the uh, perception, and that is part of the market we're trying to serve. So those are two of the biggest problems in the world that seasteading solves, in my opinion. The lack of startup innovation and governance, and all of humanity racing to the coast. <laughs> so, so can you tell the audience members who, who they see the two organizations and they want to know the differences between the two? What is the difference between Seasteading Institute and Blue Frontiers? So the Seasteading Institute was a nonprofit uh, founded almost uh, 10 years ago by Peter Thiel and Patry Friedman, who you, I don't need to introduce them, you all know who they are, uh, to promote this idea of building free cities that float on the ocean. Uh, because they could see that the technology was at hand and this would be a way to proliferate the number of countries in the world. Um, once, uh, so we have done almost exactly 10 years of, of research, of building the community, answering all the questions, and we finally got to the point where we were ready to find a host country willing to uh, host our, sea, our floating sea zone in their territorial waters. And we signed the memorandum of understanding with French Polynesia. Then we realized this is not something that requires hundreds of thousands of donations. This is something that costs, requires tens of millions uh, in, in investment. So um, uh, the executive team at the Seasteading Institute, Randy and myself, uh, founded Blue Frontiers, which is a for-profit startup company with uh, three other people, one of whom lives in Tahiti. Uh, and we've been building a huge uh, movement. We have probably 15 employees at this point. Natalie works with us uh, doing a marvelous pop podcast. We probably have 85 uh, volunteers. Uh, and I've learned from doing this that you, you don't have to pay people in money. You can pay them in meaning. Um, if you give them something, uh, uh, people want to participate in working with small groups of people to create something better and make their values manifest in the world. So everything you need to build a new community from the water up, we have an expert 
coming to us trying to help. So it's, it's really inspiring. And uh, not to take too much time, but we also uh, have started the pre-sale of our um, ICO, which is called Varion, Creating Variation in Governance, Selection Up to You. Variation in Selection is the secret recipe for evolution. So we can have evolution in governance if we proliferate these on the sea. So check out Varion. So actually, we should continue to talk about that because of, it will tie into the announcement we'll be making at the rest of this talk. So for the audience members who are not familiar with Varion, can you explain what it is and what's its intention? Varion is a uh, token of exchange uh, uh, on the blockchain, uh, uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. It's an ERC-20 token. Uh, it's going to be used as uh, a media, hopefully, Blue Frontiers, the company, is committed to uh, uh, providing services of governance and building seasteads with um, Varion. And hopefully Varion will become the uh, token of exchange in the Blue Frontiers ecosystem. Uh, it doesn't count as equity. Uh, what, what else do I need to say, Laurel, that's important? Yes, do you all hear that? If you want to register your business, if you want to, if you want to buy services on a seastead, if you want to buy a seastead, if you want to rent a seastead, you're going to do so with Varion. So we're committed to decentralizing finance, decentralizing governance, and decentralizing the very ground beneath our feet. Excellent. And so one of the most important aspects that you guys are focusing on right now is French Polynesia. Can you tell me the story of how you guys got involved in French Polynesia? Because one of your co-founders of Blue Frontiers is Mark Collins, a native uh, uh, French Polynesian. So that's yeah. a very interesting story. Yeah, and I'll try not to make that story too long. But uh, so volunteer geographical scholars, geopolitical scholars, looked at all the, ver we came up with this idea that we, c we can't go jump straight to the high seas, which was the original vision of seasteading. It's too expensive. It's unreasonable to ask um, investors to take that risk. But um, we want to use a technology that already exists. So building a floating city in shallow seas already exists. Uh, the prototype for that is the floating pavilion in Rotterdam. Those engineers are going to build our floating communities in French Polynesia. Uh, the legal innovations already exist. T Tom Bell has done all the research. Rather than imagine technologies for floating on the high sea, why don't we combine these two technologies, go to a host country, uh, offer to build a floating island in their territorial waters in exchange for any level of incremental regulatory or administrative autonomy, especially in countries that already have special economic zones on the books. So you know, we call this strategic incrementalism. It's a, it's a frontier both in law and it's a frontier in engineering. So we could use the existing technology. So we narrowed down the, the 193 nation states to about 20, where we thought we could possibly make this happen. We got pretty far into negotiations with about six, maybe more. Um, all of them get stalled because governments just don't have an incentive really to make it happen. And they're kind of like, yeah, bring in Peter Thiel's money, build your floating island, then we'll talk about the special economic zone. That's what it always came up against. Um, out of no, so fake news happened. Fake news made it happen. So uh, so much fake news is written about seasteading. Wired, uh, what's his name? Kyle Denuccio, Wired magazine said, wrote an article saying uh, uh, seasteading is dead in the water. They have nothing going on. I'll go to their website and take their images, but I'm not going to click contact and say I'm from Wired. Would would you like to talk to me? This is like when we were in the height of like trying to close on another nation. So in French Polynesia, uh, Mark Collins was reading this and he's like, wait, they aren't able to find a, a country? That's, that's amazing to me because our country would be perfect. We didn't look at French Polynesia because we thought it was France. So then Mark Collins reached out to us and, 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 and reached out to Randy on LinkedIn and then got on a call with us, and he uh, went on this spiel about French Polynesia that I was like, this guy is overselling it. It's like they have a 2004 statute of autonomy that makes them an overseas dependency of France, but they have all, this, all these rights to create their own special economic zones. The waters are warm, they're turquoise, uh, Tahiti's famously paradise, 
They have, it's a country of natural wave breakers. There's no high waves. There's no bad winds. They don't get tsunamis. The people there have a culture of, of, of maritime uh, choosing among islands. They already kind of get it. It's already in their bones. And I'm like, this is too good to be true. So we actually put together a team of 10 seasteaders and flew to French Polynesia after the president of French Polynesia wrote us a letter inviting us to come uh, meet everyone. And we found out Mark was underselling it. So we arrive in French Polynesia. I'm, I'm from New Jersey. I didn't know places like this existed. So you'd have a room like this, there's no walls. Because of the weather, it just, you let the breeze come through. There's, there's never weather that's gonna upset this, this conference. Uh, the people there, they've taken hospitality to an art form. They, they welcome you like you can't believe. It's disarming. Um, you know, the, the images of paradise are palm trees and grass skirts and dancing, and, and that all comes from French Polynesia, which used to be this unreachable paradise uh, that Europeans would pay to read about, that only the most intrepid uh, sailors could reach. Well, now it has like 52 airports, seven and a half hour flight from LA, because of our project, uh, Air Tahiti Nui, which is their airline, who sponsors all our trips there, is now making sure flights go f straight from San Francisco to Tahiti. So Tahiti is marvelous. Am I, am I talking too much? No, you're talking the right amount. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's really, it's like too good to be true. We went on this 10-day tour visiting the, the various um, uh, businesses in French Polynesia that all, 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 we thought we made up the term the blue economy. The first guy we meet is the, the minister of the blue economy and economic recovery. So one of the government ministers had a title that describes what seasteading is. Within a short period of time, he'd be vice president of the country. So what, they, what we hear in French Polynesia now is we're the original seasteaders. We've been seasteading for thousands of years, and this is, could be how we continue our tradition. Um, Excellent. So, uh, so French Polynesia is obviously probably one of the best places you could possibly have a seastead. And it's likely going to be the place of the first seastead in the world. Um, one thing that Mark Collins wants to do, though, is because seasteading is not for one particular location. It is for, for the globe. It's a global movement. While French Polynesia will be the first, uh, your, your co-founder, Mark Collins, has been trying to do initiatives to make sure that seasteads expand globally. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, the Seasteading Institute and the Startup Societies Foundation are announcing a... Actually, New Hans Network. New Hans Network? Okay. okay. So I should probably, I should, I should probably explain you, you it. Okay, I'll take it from here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so very similar to uh, uh, the difference between Seasteading Institute and Blue Frontiers, Startup Society's Foundation, many of its founders have started a for-profit consulting, marketing, and blockchain development firm specifically for startup societies. Our intention is to be a one-stop shop for the startup societies industry. Um, and we already have clients that are some of the most exciting startup societies right now. Um, and one initiative that we're doing right now is, uh, is actually with Blue Frontiers. Uh, so um, I actually was talking to Mark Collins and he's been trying this initiative to expand Seasteading to be a global movement. While everything will be focused and spearheaded in French Polynesia and based there, they still want to see of seed uh, the, the creation of, of Seasteads across the world. And when I was thinking about this, it it brought me back to one of my mentor, mentors and actually the board, director of the board of the Startup Society's Foundation. His name is Mark Fraser, and if you guys have not looked into him, look into him. He's been doing uh, Startup Society since he, for like 30 or 40 years, something ridiculous. He's been working in special economic zones all around the world, and he created a series of best practices based on all of these, uh, uh, these examples. And some of the best practices, Mark and I actually worked on a paper called Six best practices for startup societies funders. And one of the most interesting aspects that he's been looking into is using contests for uh, spurring economic, uh, spurring concessions from uh, special economic zones around the world. Because what he realizes, and sort of what uh, uh, Joe alluded to, is that a lot of governments, they realize that oftentimes they are th their only option of the startup society entrepreneur. And because of that, they can drag their feet, they can renege on deals, they can make it more difficult, or make the special economic zone unpalatable. It just, it just doesn't work anymore. Um, moreover, um, when, when people come down and try to get a concession or a memorandum of understanding, it's very top down, it's very external. There's something coming in, they're trying to get something. Versus a contest, um, versus if, if someone is incentivized to go out and get it. 
it, it shows that there's local grassroots support from it. It's not coming from the outside, it's from within. So what he decided, and it was kind of based on um, some free zone competitions in, um, in Asia, as well as based off of the Amazon cities competition, is that the best way to instigate startup society uh, uh, growth and concessions is not going to individual cities, but creating a public contest that there would be a fund or some sort of nonprofit organization that would reward people in, um, in order to secure these concessions, um, which, is, would, which would be absolutely amazing. And, and because of, if you try to centralize who does it, you're, you're going to have a, a, an information problem. If you have one organization trying to go to multiple different locations, they're not going to know the locals. They're not going to know who has the right network and who to talk to. But if you incentivize locals who have the network, who know the people, like people like Mark Collins, people who, who he knows who to talk to, if we, out, if we decentrally delegate that responsibility right there, then we can create a better movement. So what we're announcing right now is New Hans Network in conjunction with Blue Frontiers, uh, we are conducting a contest to seed, start, uh, to seed seasteads across the world. As part of the very on raise, as, as uh, Joe talked about, a, a portion of that fund will go towards contestants who uh, enter in this competition. So basically, if you are in a country around the world, you can apply for this contest and you can, at, at the first stages, uh, well actually, I'm gonna go over some of the, the stages here because there's four stages to it. The first is you're, you're applying interest. You, you take a picture of, uh, of the location that you want to use, the names of your teams, um, sort of your intentions of it, and then that's input in a database, and then on the, on the Blue Frontiers Global website, which is an organization that's going to be formed in conjunction with the contest, um, it's going to be mapped on the mark, so the seasteading community can see how many people around the world are so interested in actually creating these things. So they put that information done down, and then the next uh, round, after the round of identification, is showing a, a general letter of interest and support from a, pro a prominent government official, uh, videos or written statements indicating the community is interested, um, a summary of SEZ and tourism development that can happen, and a scenario for phased expansion, as well as opportunities for grand and land, le uh, land lease sharing. And this is a very important part. It has, the value from these seasteads has to be shared with the local communities. And as part of this competition, the land lease revenue uh, from the anchor zone, as they call it, will be shared with the local community. Because with every seastead, there will be a, uh, a, a parallel land zone in order to like jumpstart everything. So as part of the competition, um, the locals will be receiving a share of these land lease revenues, as well as um, if the semifinals will also be receiving a share from the ultimate uh, Land, uh, land lease revenues of the winning zone. And the next level is round three, which is when they uh, secure a memorandum of understanding or a letter of intent from the local and national government. Um, and they'll list all the specific reforms that the government in principle accepts. Um, and a letter of agreement from local or national authorities committed to giving Blue Frontiers its, and its allies and its local initiator first option for concessions. And a commitment from, um, from the entrepreneur, the participant in this contest, uh, to receive a portion of the land lease revenues, so as we discussed before. And all along this process, we're going to be giving materials to these contestants about what a special economic zone is and how it benefits their community. Because of, you know, while we're very excited about seasteading, there's very few people who actually understand what seasteading is or how it could benefit them. So we're going to be providing as much support as we can uh, in order to make sure that, one, they are informed about what seasteading is and what their benefit is, and two, how they go about doing it. All right, and round four is the, is the final phase of the competition, uh, and the Seastead Friendly uh, Legislation and Regulations Concession Agreement is ready to go, doesn't have to be signed, um, and the signed agreement on sharing a portion of land lease revenues and plans, um, and we will be offering plans or, or uh, personal opportunity kits to local residents so they can know how to benefit from these Seasteads. Um, Seasteading is all about decentralization, so it only makes sense that we make it uh, executed in a decentralized fashion, and the best way to do it is through these competitions. Um, and also more importantly, a competition is public. You know, it isn't behind closed doors. You're not being sneaky. You're not trying to pull something over. You're telling the world, we're doing this. We want to give you money for it. We, we, we want to share the value in what we're creating. 
Uh, we're trying to provide you a value, we're not trying to take anything. And what the contest allows you is publicly displaying that. Because if Joe and the Seasteading Institute and New Hans Network have nothing to hide. We only have value to bring. Um, and we want to provide that as much as we can, and we find this is the best incentive structure. Um, yeah, I, as a C evangelist, the male version of Natalie, <laughs> uh, I, I want to see the Mark Collinses in all the other countries of the world. Like all the other countries we were negotiating with, we were like outsiders, don't know what's going on internally, everything seems to be going great, and then everything stops, we don't understand why. It's completely different when we have a guy who's an entrepreneur, who's in Tahiti, who's served in the government, who's run num numerous businesses, has built relationships his whole life, and now is working those relationships to make it happen. All of a sudden, now we have a company building the first Seastead. So the, one of the ways the Seasteading Institute has been serving the startup societies movement is that it's creating goodwill and excitement all around the world because it's not a legal abstraction, it's like a physical floating thing with all sorts of cool technologies, which people think, oh, it's like sustainability. Um, but then they start to learn about, oh, it would be a startup society and how would the governance work? And it sort of opens them to the idea. So I know um, for all the fake news that's out there, there's goodwill being generated in countries around the world. So if you can find that local entrepreneur who's excited about seasteading, and you say, if you can get us a, 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 a letter from someone in your government inviting us to come in, um, uh, you know, I think the first prize is going to be equivalent of $100,000. No, so the, the final prize, yes, I should have mentioned that. The last prize for the winning contestant is $100,000. And the, the, uh, the, the two other phases, uh, two and three, will be receiving a share of Varion. Yes. And then I think that the, 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 the top 10 get a visit to yes. the floating pavilion in Rotterdam, which I was just at last week. Yes, all expenses paid trip to Rotterdam. Yeah, the floating pavilion in Rotterdam is this cool floating thing in, in, in Rotterdam. That's the, basically the prototype for our floating islands. So, do you guys want to win $100,000? <laughs> cool. Tom Bell sold it best. <laughs> I was planning on getting the 100000 by stealing your idea that you just had up there. <laughs> so we got a question right there. So that's, that's an excellent question. Um, so for, for the competition, we'll be reaching out to individuals we know um, personally and that are already interested, but we're also doing a global marketing campaign to make sure that the word gets out about it. So people will be, we'll, we'll certainly reach out to them to participate in the competition because if we need to support them financially, it sounds, it sounds like, because they're in dire straits. And more importantly, we need to provide them a sustainable way to 
continue their way of life despite uh, rising sea levels. And sea setting can obviously provide a solution to that. Yeah, Kiribati is right next door to, to French Polynesia. Uh, that famous weightlifter who, whether he pulled or not in the Olympics, that would do the dancing, and, and he was so charming and everybody loved him, he stole the show. He, he said, I'm trying to call attention to the fact that my country's disappearing. Uh, so do they lose their uh, uh, whole economic, uh, exclusive economic zone and don't be a country anymore in the near future? Uh, so I, I kind of want to make a pitch to the environmentalists of the world. What, instead of trying to save the planet, why don't you save uh, one country? Uh, it's not their fault that this is happening, but they could easily transition into being uh, floating uh, islands as, as their islands become seamounts, which is happening very fast in that country. Yes. Just to reinforce what you say, Adam, I see those in the margins, which are kind of right behind uh, the Kiribati in terms of places that disappear. There's this whole area of Kova, they call it a compact free association. Now, in terms of some money associated with that from the University of Hawaii, Yeah, many of the uh, outer islands in French Polynesia are being inundated fast. They could transition into being floating islands. Those could spread to Kiribati. Um, then, uh, you know, then you have an argument on the floor of the UN, are floating islands the same as, are man-made islands the same as the islands that are right there? I think you have a humanitarian case that Kiribati gets to um, continue to be a country and continue to have the special economic zone around the outer islands that might sink. Um, what if babies are born in those islands? Are they, you make another case. And then we have a, a legal precedent for floating islands um, being sovereign. Then you can build more next door in international waters. Uh, the Pacific Ocean is just has uh, tens of thousands of sea mounts that come to within 100 meters of the surface that you could tether to and proliferate. Max? I don't think so. I would uh, punt that one to O'Shane Balloon, our legal advisor. But the, the seas is already sort of an advanced functioning framework over which things travel. It's the most, uh, it's the richest economy in the world. 90% of all international trade doesn't go across borders on land, but across ships. Um, but we're on a legal frontier too, because there's no legal definition of a seastead. There's artificial islands, there's vessels, they're all uh, governed under different rules. Uh, something that permanently floated in international waters would be a completely unique entity. Um, yes, sir. Uh, almost all our documents have been published, and if uh, legislation passes in uh, French Polynesia, those will be published. So it's all available at, at bluefrontiers.com. And again, we're going to be creating toolkits to explain uh, the benefit of land leases to uh, um, con uh, contestants in, in the contest, as well as I'm sure um, residents and citizens of French Polynesia. Multiple entries and participate in multiple geographies. 
So um, it, as part of the contest, we already allow for multiple uh, multiple sites, same teams, multiple sites. So it's basically, is it multiple submissions by geography, basically, or is it one holistic team submission? Yeah, it's a, it's a team submission. And you'd have uh, multiple um, sites included in that one submission. Ah, Atosa. You'll have to ask those guys. They, they worked at the Seasteading Institute before I came on, and then they broke away to form uh, Blue Seed. Uh, last I hear, they're still going, but uh, I think they haven't raised the capital to get the, the, sh the ship just off the coast of Silicon Valley to get around the HB1 visas. You mentioned uh, that the currency uh, variant is that, uh, Well, we, uh, I mean, any services, any business that registers on the Seastead will uh, hopefully uh, use Vari uh, Varion in its exchanges. So would you be like taking a fee then, like when the business comes on to the Seastead and then that fee maybe goes back to token holders or something like that? Perhaps. I don't know how that's going to be arranged. Let's okay. Would this be an annual contest? I mean, when is it like? So we're actually launching the website tonight. So you can start your submissions almost immediately. In that regard, I, I do want you to know I will accept a check for the hundred pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. If, if there's anyone in the world that I, that I trust to, to, to build a seastead out there, it'd be the guy who started the city from scratch, so. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. All right. All right, excellent. Do we have any more questions from the audience about the contest or sea sitting in general? Ah. Uh, Joe, I'm wishing you the best success, and it sounds amazing. I do have this as a business friendly economic query. Uh, does, does it need to have its own currency? So New Amsterdam, the, the colonies of America, we lasted for hundreds of years without having our own currency, we had you know, Spanish coin, Dutch coin, the uh, East India Company had its own, actually they did have their own currency, so maybe that would be a set of points on your side. Uh, but they were just trading whatever they wanted. Why, why do we be encouraging people to be using this particular coin to pay registration fees? Why don't you just say, let people pay in dollars or Bitcoin or whatever they To get around, uh uh, very strict regulations in various countries to be more inclusive of more people. More people can get involved this way around the world. Uh, to be more transparent uh, and to radically decentralize finance itself. Uh, that's the short answer. Uh, well, why does, why do, does your floating thing need to also be bundled with this new finance thing? Why don't you let Citibank or JP Morgan or Bitcoin Because uh, we want it to be uh, a, a global thing that's not where Citibank and those guys aren't involved. And that will engage all sorts of uh, regulations that we don't want. So we want maximum uh, freedom in what we're doing. Chris, uh, got a question in the audience? So the question is, how much does CSID would cost? I think we're working it out that it's going to average to about uh, 200K uh, per person. Um, and there's all sorts of ways that can be arranged. There's going to be villas. There's going to be apartments. There's going to be single family homes. Uh, about 25% of the uh, 
spaces are going to be prioritized for Polynesians. So that's just an average of what it would cost, and we're looking for this to be kind of like uh, iPhones that would, we could drive down the cost as we learn more about how to build them. Um, and that's also one of the benefits of having a sea zone, because if you're in an area where it's not in international waters, the sea sets can be cheaper. Right. Yes. Did you have an answer or a question, Natalie? I was going to compliment what you said, that there are many things that float. Like there are floating uh, landing platforms, floating parks, floating hotels. There's many things that float. So a sea set is not just a floating building or a floating house. It needs that regulatory component. So in order to be fully decentralized, we need the sea zone. We need the special economic zone. So I was just complimenting that it's not just us being in charge of the thing that floats. For that thing that floats to match the decentralized principles from where we come from, it needs to have the decentralized regulation as well. Yeah. And cryptocurrency people are, some of them have made a lot of money really fast. They're really idealistic. They want to do something awesome and cool, and they want to, and they want to get involved with Varian. Um, so let's say I go, uh, I live in one of these places, and then a hurricane comes over. What do we do? Well, we're starting in a place where there's no hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> no hurricanes, no tsunamis. Uh, no pirates. No, no piracy act has ever been recorded in uh, all of French Polynesia, and it's the size of Western Europe. No terrorists. Low crime. But let's say that they did want to make a, a seastead in the Caribbean. Like, let's say we had one of the contestants. Like, this young gentleman right here, he's, he's incredibly ambitious. Um, he, 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 he submits to the contest, and, and you know, it's actually, they, they secure really good concessions from Puerto Rico. Would, you, would it be a possibility? Well, then we're talking about high expenses because, um, you know, uh, oil platforms, for instance, are in places where hurricanes happen, but they're very expensive, uh, and you have to tether them. So you generally don't want to start a Blue Frontiers seastead in a hurricane place unless you can bring significantly more investment to that project. Maybe it's an opportunity to really work on resilient infrastructure. <laughs> Yeah, like a, a coastal town is a sitting duck, but if you can disassemble with a, a day or two of warning and... Yeah, right, right. And so we won't take any more questions, but if you guys want to do any closing statements, we're happy to leave that time. Bye, Varian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think the, the, the biggest thing uh, about the competition, about the Sea Setting Institute, is that it's not one organization that's doing it. It's all in your hands. The point of the competition is to say, we're giving, you take the water and you run with it. It's your movement. I mean, the sea setting movement has, has been at that from the very beginning. They've even had an event that's been going on for like 10 years now called Ephemeral, which is basically uh, the sea setting equivalent to Burning Man, uh, where they get a bunch of boats together and, it's, um, and they start like making platforms. This isn't run by a central organization. It's totally community run and people are just running with it. We're, with the competition, we're just providing a path that sea setters have been taking since the very beginning, where they'd essentially go out and make it happen. So there's a ton of really interesting, super dedicated, influential people in this room. So I have no doubts that I'll be getting at least a couple of submissions from you guys. And uh, let us know how we can help you anyway. I'm really excited to be announcing it and visit the website tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>